Disney's Disneyland. When you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Each week as you enter this timeless land, one of these many worlds will open to you. Tomorrowland, promise of things to come. Fantasyland, the happiest kingdom of them all. Frontierland, tall tales and true from the legendary past. Adventureland, the wonder world of nature's own realm. Presenting this week from Adventureland to the South Pole for science. And now your host, Walt Disney. In this age of science, there have been few times as important as the present. For this is the time of the IGY. As many of us know, these letters stand for International Geophysical Year. And this in turn means that the world's greatest scientists have combined their brain power in a mass attack on the frontiers of knowledge. One of the most forbidding and yet most suitable areas in which to gain scientific information is the region of the South Pole. In previous television shows, we've seen how Navy Task Force 43 set up two IGY stations in Antarctica. But that was only the beginning. The complete IGY plan called for many such observation points in locations all over this vast ice-locked continent. Most important, perhaps, would be a base at the uttermost end of the Earth, right here at the South Pole itself. To set up these bases, and particularly the pole base, was a dramatic and continuing struggle. To tell you about it, we're going to take you first to the studio's special effects stage and your narrator, Winston Hibbler. As a rule, we begin these adventures in Antarctica with our three-dimensional model. And so many people have asked how it works. This time, we're going to give you a backstage view and let you see just how we set up and shoot our first model scene. And while the men are getting ready, I'll fill in with a few statistics. Can we have a little more light, please? Now, the model was cast in fiberglass from a plaster mold. The disc is 12 feet across and would project into a globe 114 feet in circumference. The topography of the model is based on the most recent Navy charts. For dramatic effect, however, we've forced the true perspective. For large as the model is, in true scale, 15,000 foot mountains would just be ripples on the land. The Antarctic landmass was cast separately and permanently fastened to the basic disk. But the ever-changing icebergs and ice flows are separate pieces, and we use literally thousands of them. True scale ships would be invisible. The smallest we use are slightly over one inch long. These larger ones are used for close-ups, and they're about four inches long. And now before we shoot the scene, a little review. Uh, Frank, will you move me out over the model, please? Now we should remember that the Antarctic summer is our winter. And so it was in our winter of 1955 and 56 that the Navy established two IGY stations in Antarctica. One at McMurdo Sound, and the other at Little America. This was called Operation Deep Freeze One. Deep Freeze Two began late in 1956, and its purpose was to set up five additional bases. Number three would be here in Marie Birdland. Number four at the South Pole. Number five in Wilkes Land. Number six at the tip of Victoria Land. And number seven over here on the coast of the Weddell Sea. Now, as we tell the story of each of these bases, remember they were all constructed simultaneously. And that was during the four months period between November 1956 and February 1957. Okay, Hip, we're ready. Fine, it's all yours. Okay, stand by, camera's ready. Roll it. Okay, start the ships, please. 
Antarctica begins where the tip of the Palmer Peninsula touches the 63rd parallel. Here in early December 1956, two ships pushed southeast into the Weddell Sea. The Wyandotte, a cargo ship, and the Staten Island, a Navy icebreaker. Their mission, to set up Ellsworth Base Number 7. Still far from land, the convoy made pre-planned stops at several ocean stations, so the scientists could begin the many research projects of the IGY. Marine biologists, using special underwater grabs, were combing the floor of the Weddell Sea for specimens of submarine life. Of all the oceans, Antarctic waters are richest in a mixture of animal and vegetable life called plankton on which many fishes, large and small, feed. And so there's more potential food in an acre of South Polar Seas than anywhere else on Earth. An overpopulated world of the future might depend almost entirely on food from the sea. So the knowledge gained about these and other vital organisms could well be of life and death importance to mankind. The mysteries of these partly charted waters also attracted the oceanographers aboard. Plunging steel containers called Nansen bottles to various depths, they trapped samples of seawater by corking the bottles with metal slugs. One way to measure the exact depth is to make allowance for the angle of descent. hold specimens not only of the sea, but of the hidden currents and streams within the sea, and each has its story to tell. Part of that story is in the temperature taken at a given level, another in the content of salt and other minerals, which show up in chemical tests. All these findings will later be compared with those made by scientists of ten other nations, who also have bases in Antarctica. Perhaps the largest number of IGY studies concerns the atmosphere. Balloon tests play an important part in long-range weather forecasting. Because all weather is a chain reaction, tracking a small turbulence here may forewarn of a major storm front on the other side of the globe. So sailing, stopping, working, the task group moved southward. In these barren wastes, to come upon any other voyager was a welcome sight indeed. As this hardy little Norwegian whaler passed by, she blinked friendly greetings and valuable advice on navigating conditions in the waters ahead. Now the wind rose and mercury dropped. Antarctica's howling breath congealed the ocean spray and wrapped the ships in straight jackets of frost. In a matter of hours, the sea condensed to slush. The slush clotted to brash ice. the icebreaker was in her element. By December 17th, the jaws of Antarctica's giant vice were almost impossible to pry apart. Through the eyes of her helicopter, the Staten Island could survey the full expanse of her problem.
reports from aloft only confirmed what was obvious from below. Nothing but a trackless waste of white. Not a single weak spot within reach. Twisting, tacking, turning, by sheer brute force, the Staten Island found ways of moving on. But by December 23rd, there was no longer any place to go. In a matter of hours, the ships would be frozen fast. So the icebreaker poured on the coals and crashed toward the cargo ship. For Christmas, it would be nice to be together. By Christmas Day, both vessels were beset, and nobody knew for how long. The horizon was bleak and empty, and when something did appear on it, it was only a mirage. Whoever had breath that wasn't frozen turned it into song, and the traditional carol seemed to hold a deeper meaning, for here amidst these icy wastes was the true spirit of Christmas. Gifts and greetings long stowed in lockers came forth to make a bright moment for everyone. But beneath the festive spirit, there was an undercurrent of apprehension. The fate of the mission, indeed the very lives of the men themselves, hung on a whim of the weather. It could keep the ships in this stranglehold for days or even weeks. But on the 26th, only two days later, a lucky change in wind and current. never before charted, the convoy struck out directly for the continent. Its destination, Cape Adams, here at the base of the Palmer Peninsula. To the planners of the expedition, this had seemed an ideal spot for a science station. But plans made on maps are sometimes spoiled by reality. For at Cape Adams, the Filchner Ice Shelf presented an unbroken bulwark, hundreds of miles long and more than 200 feet high. the ships tried to bombard their way in. But it was like trying to blast a wall of concrete with BB shot. And so the leaders of the expedition decided to reverse course again. They would cruise along the Weddell coast until a dip was found in the endless barrier low enough to serve as a mooring place. Somewhere in this unbroken wall of defiance, there must be a gap. seemed level and smooth, like the frosting on a monstrous cake. But now success was at last in the making. From Cape Adams, where their first landing attempt had failed, the task unit had cruised 300 miles to the east. And here at the other end of the Filchner Shelf, a dip or low point was located. At once, the icebreaker began a frontal attack.
icebreaker took as good as she gave. But what she took, she gave back again. <laughs> Swinging about, parallel to the rampart, the sharp axe blade of her bow in a shearing action carved out the final shape of the pier. On January 27th, cargo ship was safely docked. Her hold gave up all the supplies needed to make up Ellsworth base number seven, including the vehicles to take them there. The station was laid out two and a half miles inland. Since a change in current, a shift in wind, could lock the ships in ice again, Everybody, the CBs, sailors, and the scientists, pitched in to help build the base. Working 24 hours a day, the men achieved the impossible. The schedule allowed two months for completing the base, but the job was done in 15 days. This truly remarkable accomplishment kept Operation Deep Freeze II right on schedule. Today, Ellsworth is one of the outstanding research spots of the IGY. It serves in all phases of study, involving the surface of our world and its envelope of air. It was on the 11th of February, 1957, that the construction crew, too worried to know or care, it had broken all polar building records, returned aboard the ships. final so long, and a hearty good luck to those who stayed behind. And then the Navy's little convoy nosed out of its self-made harbor and headed for other shores and other chores. We're moving across the continent now and back through time to November 1956. Here on the edge of the Ross Sea lies Little America 5 the operational center of the task force. Right now, the planning staff here is firming up final details for IGY station number three to be called Bird Base. Phase one will be a joint Army-Navy job, blazing and building the trail for the tractor trains. This super highway over the snow will be 620 miles long. Only part of the route has been explored, but already there's a major problem, a large crevasse area. Here beneath a thin crust of snow lies a network of subterranean canyons, their width and depth unknown. Yet somehow a safe, dependable trail must be found or constructed through this region. The road builders travel light. All the tons of material and supplies needed to build Bird Base will come later. Attached to the lead vehicle is the crevasse detector. Its electronic feelers grope along the surface of the snow, and the instant a pitfall is discovered, a warning signal is flashed to a recording device in the cab. On November 6th, the trail makers began a journey and a job that could last for days or weeks or even months. But whatever the time, at Little America, air support would be standing by, ready to fly out supplies or personnel as needed. For the first 70 miles, there were no difficulties, no problems. Just smooth snow and easy going. Then, a sudden change in terrain and a warning. Danger below. Luckily, this was only a small, shallow opening, but it was also a telltale sign. The trail party was at the brink of the crevasse area. 
so the men went to work with the tools of their trade. And the first of these is dynamite. The technique here is to blast off the covering crust. This exposes the full size of the pocket. Then between the solid ice walls, a fill of snow is packed, firm enough to support any load. Now the warnings came one after another. Stops were frequent, and probing became necessary. Everywhere under the snow, weak spots and pockets were discovered. In a spot like this, a little air reconnaissance can be a big help. And so a call went back to the base. The helicopter contacted the ground party by radio and then began a sweep of the surrounding terrain. From the air, danger spots are often revealed by changes in the smoothness and shading of the surface. Each time the copter crew spotted an obvious hazard, they would pick up and replace the trail markers. aid, the trail party prepared to inch forward again. But now they were taking the utmost precautions. Ropes and inner tubes replaced human hands at the tractor controls. They called this Operation Plow Line. Now if the tractor plunged into a crevasse, at least it wouldn't take the driver with it. Detector, the blinker was working overtime. It was apparent the trail party had reached the very heart of the danger area. Another blast. A 200 pounder this time. And it opened up the granddaddy of all potholes. Since nothing more could be learned on the surface, it was time to go into the matter a little deeper. Perhaps an eyewitness could discover the true dimensions of the labyrinth below. But what the eye did witness was incredible. Blue-green grottos and ivory arches. Glittering alcoves and gleaming corridors crossing and crisscrossing in all directions. In such a crystal palace, Anne's Christian Anderson's Snow Queen could have dwelt. Even her crown jewels were here, diamonds and emeralds by the clump and cluster, studding the walls in a dazzling profusion. But in this place of surpassing beauty, there could be heard an ominous undertone. For out of the depths of the caverns came the voice of the Antarctic, sounds of the restless ice, a continent forever on the move, down from the pole to the sea by five relentless feet a day. To the explorers, the crevasses, despite their awesome beauty, were just a monstrous roadblock, and it was wrecking their time schedule. This was a top-level crisis, and it called for a top-level decision. The task force commander, Admiral Dufek, was flown to the site. Briefed on the facts, the Admiral called an on-the-spot staff meeting. 
Since the nature and general direction of the larger crevasses were now known, the job at hand was to find, blast, and bridge the narrowest points. Above all, time was the essence, and the first step was to fill this yawning abyss under their feet. of snow finally plugged the gap. The chasm became a turnpike. The road builders could move on again. But nature had laid a final trap. The other end of the crevasse area was a veritable honeycomb of potholes. A careful survey and a half a hundred flags finally marked a safe, solid trail through this last obstacle course. Two weeks and three tons of TNT later, the road builders could begin to relax. They'd reached the safety of the Rockefeller Plateau. At once, word was flashed to Little America. And this was the news military and scientific personnel had been waiting for. Now, the largest tractor and sled train ever assembled could get underway. Leaving on the 5th of December, the lumbering snow vehicles carried all the 500 tons of material and equipment with which to build bird base. Without the wizardry of the road makers, this snow caravan might have ended up at the bottom of some icy Grand Canyon. But just three weeks later, with everything in good order, the tractor train lumbered past the final mile post, 620 miles from Little America. Christmas Eve saw construction of the new station well underway. Under the bright but heatless sun, in temperatures 50 degrees below zero, the men could work only in short hitches. Just the same, bird base shaped up on schedule. At this very moment, the barracks, tunnels, labs, and observation domes all are making their contributions to the IGY. And so the Navy's pioneers had won another victory against the elemental forces of Antarctica. And now time rolls back again, and we return to the final two weeks of December 1956. Here at the tip of Victoria Land, a cargo ship, the Arneb, and a Coast Guard icebreaker, the Northwind, had been assigned to establish a base on Cape Hallett. It was the only accessible spot in hundreds of miles, and it was ideal. It had a natural harbor and plenty of open ground. But unfortunately, it had plenty of penguins, too. For countless carefree generations, the birds had lived here undisturbed. But now, science must be served. The penguins had to go. And so began one of the oddest campaigns in all the Navy's history. The landing party had explicit orders. The birds were not to be harmed, simply displaced. But as it turned out, that took a deal of doing. Although well armed with butterfly nets and cartons, the invaders were also well outnumbered. And so they decided to employ the time-tested strategy of divide and conquer. According to the naturalists, penguins are passive birds, friendly to man. But don't count on it. The Navy's strategy began to pay off. And as each sector was cleared, a penguin-proof fence was thrown up around it. And 
So, inch by inch, penguin by penguin, the Navy took over the beachhead. Now there remained only the mopping up operation. Altogether, Operation Penguin took about a week. And as a last bulwark against possible counterattack, a second line of defense was erected. And this, quite unexpectedly, uncovered a whole nursery of fat fledglings. These two were turned out firmly but gently to join their kinfolk. But in the displaced penguin camp, rejoining the family circle was no easy matter. Confusion and bewilderment reigned supreme. There were mothers with too many children and mothers with none at all. And to further muddle the mix-up, there were youngsters who insisted on adopting mothers not even related to them. she's shaken off one of her problems. Finally, with nowhere to go and her resistance low, the lady at last gives in. After all, babies have to be fed, whosoever they are. And so for the penguins, total defeat. For the Navy, victory. Until with one mighty blast, they wiped out all their hard-won gains. Actually, the CBs were only trying to clear a ramp for the landing craft, but the explosion utterly demoralized the natives. In wild confusion, they headed right back where they came from. And so all that had been so carefully done was undone and the patter of little feet echoed through the campground, filling every nook and cranny. The defeated occupation forces threw in the towel. If you can't lick them, learn to live with them. But peace with the penguins could not forestall a grimmer war declared by the weather. A sudden shift in the wind and the bay was jammed with pack ice, while through the pack, an immense iceberg bore directly down on the Arnep. And then a change in current and a narrow miss. But the damage had already been done. Under the tremendous pressure, the Arnep's plates had buckled like tin. Her lower holes were flooding. As a stopgap, mattresses were shoved into the breach. Emergency pumps began siphoning the seawater out of the holes and back into the sea. The damaged part of the ship was shored up and braced from the inside. Another change in current left the Arneb in open water now heavy landing craft were hung far outboard, bringing the sight of her injury above water level. After the stove-in parts were cut out, templates were made of the damaged area. And finally, emergency plates were welded into place. On January 9th, 1957, Hallett Base Number 6 was finished. It would be jointly occupied by the United States, New Zealand, and the Penguins. This job done, the Navy moved on. Another voyage, another base. This time on the coast of Wilkesland. 
But Antarctica never surrenders her sovereign domain without an argument. And now she dispatched her white-clad champions, the mighty icebergs, to meet all challengers in a silent tournament. Iceberg Alley, they called it. A place of beauty, a place of peril. But with expert navigation, the convoy ran the course without a scratch. On February 1st, in Vincennes Bay, the ships hove to for landing operations. Two weeks later, Wilkes Base, IGY Station Number 5, was finished and fully active. The Antarctic calendar turns back one more time to November 1956. And at the Williams Air Facility on McMurdo Sound, a truly momentous operation was just beginning. A final push to establish a base at the South Pole for science. In this daring and hazardous climax to Operation Deep Freeze II, the Marine Corps and the Air Force cooperated with the Navy. The first phase was the airlift, for which the Navy supplied the two-motored R4Ds while the Air Force had sent in several of their huge Globemasters. These ships were now taking on the materials, equipment, and scientific instruments they would drop upon the nethermost end of the Earth, 850 miles away. November 19th, the first cargo flight swept up and away from McMurdo into the thin Antarctic air. Soon the planes were soaring past McMurdo's towering landmark, Mount Erebus, an active volcano, 13,200 feet high and the only natural hotspot on this continent of ice. miles out lay the Beardmore Glacier. Fifty years ago, across this great river of ice, Captain Robert Scott and his ill-fated party struggled on foot to reach the pole. It took them three months. But now the Globemasters were spanning the same distance in four hours. A few moments more, and there it was, the uttermost end of the Earth, the bleak, featureless South Polar Plateau. The R-4Ds had already arrived, and one of them was blasting off again with a JADO assist. From the other plane, the landing party was still unloading survival gear. The temperature was 35 degrees below zero. With the departure of the second R-4D, the landing party was on its own, but not for long. Now the Globemasters zeroed in, and their first bomb was a real blockbuster. A three-ton weasel. It hit squarely on the target, but not on the South Pole, for it was a fact that no one yet knew exactly where the South Pole was. On the spot observations, however, indicated it was about eight miles away. And since the weasel had been damaged in the drop, dog sleds flown in with the men carried the landing party to the designated location. Here, a temporary camp was established. And later it was proved that this was indeed the true geographic South Pole. The Malamutes, in their element, felt right at home. Now, all around the clock, the sky above exploded with the flowering white pods that soon took root in the ice and blossomed into yellow tents, red sleds, and green Jamesway huts.
All of this cargo was being scattered over a two-mile area, and to haul it to the building site, a tractor was needed. And right on cue, here she comes. It was a critical moment. If this seven-ton D2 should break loose, if the drop should fail, then the project itself would fail, and the South Pole Station would be abandoned. But she made it, not even a bolt jarred loose. And with the crisis over, the men turned to another problem, the water supply. But on a continent holding 90% of the world's ice, water isn't really a problem at all. Here, a drink is measured by the cubic foot, only you don't get all you gather. In fact, the reduction of snow to water is about five to one. The Snowflake Brigade, as this supply unit was called, took its white harvest to a melter, a simple gadget run on the exhaust heat of the big power generators. During the winter months, snow for the melter will be mined from a shaft directly under the base itself. On the 19th of December, while the airlift to the pole was still in daily operation, a serious problem developed at McMurdo. With a sudden rise in temperature, the airstrip had become unusable. The trouble lay in numberless potholes that pitted the runway everywhere. So the men undertook the unlikely task of filling all the pits and hollows in a 6,000 foot long airstrip. There was danger here, too, for the bay ice was only about 15 feet thick. These methods were much too slow, and the results negligible. Very clearly, this was a situation that called for a super expert. So Admiral Dufek radioed for an assist and got it. All the way from Greenland, by air to New Zealand, and by ship to McMurdo, came Dr. Azure, an ice specialist. At once he went to work with the strange tools of his trade. He diagnosed the sickness of the airstrip and considered measures for curing it. Even when a peeping Tom popped up, the good doctor was only briefly distracted. And then he returned to his chores. Carefully, methodically, Dr. Azure and his assistants sawed, sliced, drilled, and chipped samples of ice to be weighed, measured, and subjected to various stress and strain analyses. Every symptom was painstakingly recorded, and even the patient's temperature was taken. Unfortunately, it was still way above normal. The cylindrical samples punched out of the airstrip went to a field laboratory. And here they were squeezed unmercifully until they suffered a complete breakdown. Finally, a prescription guaranteed to cure. Fill the potholes, layer by layer, with finely chopped ice, dispensed from a special pulpy mixer. Then as the layers freeze and fill to the top, roll down smoothly and tamp with giant rollers. By February 9th, the cure was complete. And so the freighters of the sky were summoned back from exile to continue air hauling cargo to the South Pole Station.
planes were soaring past the final mountain barrier, the Queen Maud range. Then once again, the polar plateau came into view. Through the plane's canopy, the sky flashed like a star sapphire, and the silken shoots bloomed. Out of the blue rained food and fuel, lumber, clothing, and scientific equipment. Less breakable materials were free dropped from low altitudes. The construction of this South Pole station makes a fitting climax to our story. For indeed it was the most notable achievement of all the Antarctic enterprises. Eighteen volunteers would winter over here, and to build the base was costing roughly a million dollars per man, but it was worth it. For this was the one vantage point on Earth where the most exact data could be obtained on meteorology, gravity, rotation of the Earth, and many other IGY disciplines. Of course, the South Pole had to have a South Pole. Striped orange and black, and capped with a mirrored globe, it would serve as a beacon to the planes and to anyone who strayed beyond the horizon at this ultimate rim of the world. The completion of the pole station marked mission accomplished for Operation Deep Freeze II. And this salute was in tribute not only to the 3,500 men who had conquered Antarctica for science, but also to the pioneers of the past, to Roel Amundsen and Robert Scott, for whom this base was named. The most lasting tribute, however, will be the incalculable fund of knowledge that these Antarctic stations will add to the welfare of all mankind.